I want to speak to you about the idol of success. This is going to take us through a few weeks at least. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 7 through 15. And the story goes over the narrative is over verse 1 through 15, but I'm going to uh, rephrase the first part of it so that we can uh, quicken it. Would you listen to the words of the pop legend Madonna as she describes her dismal issue with the seduction of success? She says this, I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it, and then to discover myself as a special human being, and then to get another stage, I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. Again and again, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre, and that's always pushing me, pushing me, because even though I'm become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended and probably never will. How many of us today find ourselves within this sort of paradox or tension of the fact that we're like Madonna in some ways, driven by the thought not of excellence or doing something great for God or any other reason, but driven by the fear of failure in mediocrity? The problem of this mentality is is that success becomes like a drug. It satisfies for short periods of time and then we uh, move on from there and the luster does not last and we're driven back to the same place which we started from. When the driving forces of your life are not joy but fear, then we have become idolaters of the source of that fear. And as one woman said, achievement has become the alcohol of our time. Perhaps we can learn, I believe, uh, from a man named Jesus, little story, as he preaches his inaugural sermon in Luke chapter 4. He mentions two people, the widow of Zarephath, pagan people keep in mind, and also this man that we're going to look at this morning, who is named Naaman. So go back in time with me, if you will, this morning, and let's enter into the text and see this idol of success and how it can uh, inhibit our lives. Naaman, who is a highly successful commander of the army of Aram, which is now called modern Syria, he is more than a commander. He is in the position of what we would call a prime minister. He's successful. He's highly decorated. He's valiant. He has uh, obtained what we would call or look at the designer life, if you will. Yet he is plagued by one thing. He has the skin disease called leprosy. So one of his servants, a little girl captured in the war with Israel, has made it known that there is a prophet in Samaria. And he can heal Naaman's disease. And so they go about it in their bureaucratic, diplomatic, and wealthy, worldly way. And Naaman's traveled to Israel with a hoard of gold and silver and clothing. And he has a signed letter to the king of Aram, from the king of Aram to the king of Israel. So now this morning, let's enter into the text in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 7 through 15. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and he said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him a message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger to him to say, Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on his name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the rivers of Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and he went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went out to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself into the Jordan seven times as a man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Verse 15, Then Naaman 
And all of his attendants went back to the man of God and he stood before him and he said, Now I know that there is no God in all of the world except in Israel. So please accept this gift from your servant. Lord, I pray that you would bless your word. Father, that this morning that you would explode it before our eyes. In the multiplicity of my words, Lord God, we pray this one thing, that we would hear your voice this morning. Explode your word before our eyes that we might see, that we might understand, that we might know who you are, Jesus. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. I was listening to a young pastor speak about his church not long ago. Ten years ago, he started a church with 120 people. Ten years from that date, he has 25,000 people in his congregation. It's an unbelievable story of what you would even deem it as the world's success or a church success. Planning on this church and then all of a sudden it explodes to 25,000 people. And so he said he was just anxious about it. They reached their 10-year anniversary and he's frustrated and he's anxious about the future of what the church would be like. And he says, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know that I have what it takes to go to the next level or to take this church where it needs to go for the next ten years. I have no clue. And he said the Lord spoke to him at that moment of prayer and said, boy, did you have what it took for the first ten years. I mean, that's the reality of our lives, that we're caught in this tension, that somehow we think success is something that we do. And we idolatrize everything in our lives. That it's somehow, this is my stuff. This is my things. This is what I have. And we must understand that we have to let God do what we cannot. In my context of my life right now, I think about it all the time. I mean, I'm just sort of an anxiety-prone person anyways. I have a mind that is rabid in some ways and thinks all the time, worries a lot or whatnot. Uh, I've, I've been told this since a child that I, my mind can run wild or whatnot. Uh, I mean, if I was left up to my own devices, I can tell you that I'd probably be somewhere in some type of asylum because just the way that my mind works. And my wife might agree with that, but... Uh, these last several months, you know, you worry about your know, wife is pregnant and about ready to have the baby, and then you worry about your unborn child, you worry about your wife coming through labor, all of the hardship that happens there. Uh, um, uh, even last night, okay, we're in the middle of the night, uh, uh, I'm trying to take care of the kids, and, and Becca had to go to the doctor because she had, was running a fever, uh, she had to go to the ER and uh, uh, be treated for uh, uh, an infection from the pregnancy. So, I mean, all these worries and Wilson's and the fragility of life and all of that, I feel the Lord say to me, Scott, before your bride was ever called Rebecca, she was my bride first. So I don't know why in the world you're trying to take all the duties that I have. Jesus called her my bride way before I ever called her my bride. He called my children His children way before I ever even thought about them in the womb. And the reality is is that we must uh, understand this tension in our lives, that this is who God is. And when we uh, become anxious in our own success, it's because we're trying to usurp some type of control that we never had in the first place, but it is God's to begin with. In the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis uh, gives us this beautiful illustration. Here you have, uh, uh, in the magician's nephew, uh, young Diggory and the Aslan, the Jesus figure of all C.S. Lewis's stories, the great lion. And uh, uh, Diggory comes to the lion and he says, Would you give my mother some of this magic fruit in your land so that she can be healed? She's dealing with this chronic illness for years and years. And so at that moment, Diggory bows his head thinking that the lion would scorn his precocious uh, thoughts and comments. But then he looks up at the lion and he sees a tear streaming down the face of the lion. And at that moment, Diggory realized that that lion cared more for his mother than he did. That the lion cared more for his family than even Diggory could. This is all of our issues of stress and anxiety and achievement in life. I think they're directly uh, trying to take a job that is not ours, but it's God, and taking upon ourselves some form of idolatry of self. 
that we're God, that we can control it, that we can handle the problems of life. And I think that we can succeed by somehow God might fail, so we'll succeed for Him. But the truth is, is that everywhere Israel failed, Jesus succeeds. Everywhere we fail, Jesus succeeds. And this is why the King of Israel begins to tear His robes. How can I? Do I have the power of life and death? How could I heal this man? In his book, Soul Keeping, by John Ortberg, he writes, Here we commit idolatry every day. It is the sin of soul meeting its needs with anything that distances us from God. So the king of Israel tears his clothes, his robes, at the egregious thought that somehow, diplomatically, he could control the power of God by writing letters and receiving gold or silver. But he does what is right in attributing the life-giving ability to God. God is the God of the resurrection. There is nothing we can do to give life to the dead. No doctor can raise a man to life after being dead three days. Only God can do that. It's the world's philosophers and sages and counselors of our time that try to take bad men and make them good. But it's only Jesus alone who takes dead men and makes them alive. This is the Gospel. Despite all of Naaman's accomplishments in his life, there's one thing that he cannot change. He is still a leper. The disease of the dark cloud looming over a parade. Naaman is branded in his culture as unclean, a diseased man. In my mind, I imagine him that he's not able to hug or to hold his children. He's not able to have relations with his wife. He's totally set off and cast aside before the fear of the communication of the disease to other people. Every night he wakes in the morning to the idea that there is skin flaking in his bed from his body. It has the stigma of all that we reality we face in the stigma of cancer in our culture today. I can imagine that is this great commander is out with his troops and he goes to a small pool uh, where he can see his reflection and he stoops down to get a drink of water that he's repulsed by his own image because he remembers his disease is ever present. But I'll tell you, I don't believe that the problem is so much Naaman's disease of leprosy. The problem is is that Naaman has another terminal illness that if it is left unchecked will make him uh, implode upon himself because that terminal illness is called sin. You can have all the success of life around you, money, cars, houses, things, But the truth is, is your sin is ever present with you unless it's been taken away by someone else. Your success can never take away your sin. It's constantly overshadowing the ever-present disease that goes with us everywhere. The conflict of Naaman's tragedy is on every side. What he is dealing with is not the uh, leprosy of his skin. What he's dealing with is the leprosy of his soul. But a glimmer of hope occurs when the plot of the young Israelite girl knows a prophet in Samaria. Suddenly hope enters the scene in the conflict and is transferred from this little Israelite slave girl to the wife of Naaman, from Naaman uh, of his wife to Naaman himself and then to the king of Syria. Hope is a contagious thing. It rips through people's hearts and gets their minds off of the conflict and onto the resolution. However, hopes are quickly dashed at the bureaucracy of trying to get somebody healed by a prophet that you're at war with all the time. Get somebody healed by a prophet in another nation that you're at war with. The reason that that hope even entered into Naaman's household is because there was a raiding band that had captured that little girl from Israel. But the glimmer of hope occurs nonetheless. The prophet however, uh, is seen that in this bureaucracy he circumvents it all. And he sends word to Naaman. He says, come to the door of the prophet in Samaria. And Naaman obeys. And Naaman's obedience is short-lived, however. He's upset that Elisha didn't come out. I mean, he, didn't, he stayed at the house. He's probably sitting in his easy chair watching football or something like that. He sends a servant. He says, go wash in the Jordan region, uh, River seven times. 
And now Naaman becomes the problem to his healing at this point. He wanted Na- uh, the, the, the prophet to come out of his house to you know, do some smoke and mirrors, to wave his hands, and to uh, make something appear, uh, disappear from his body. However, none of that happens. He just gets the word, go and wash. But notice who the heroes of Naaman's healing are. The servants. The servant. The servant girl who transfers the hope from the beginning that there is a God in Israel. That there is a prophet in Israel. The servant of Naaman who says, this, if it were a hard thing, you would accomplish it. You would succeed in it. But since it's so simple, why? Why not go and just try it and see what happens? The heroes of Naaman's healing are the slaves and the servants. I've heard a story not long ago that um, there was this grandfather and his grandson, uh, and they were headed to Chuck E. Cheese for a day together. And as they were on the way, there was a huge traffic jam because there was this big truck, semi-truck and trailer, that had wedged itself underneath a low-lying bridge. So they have all these engineers out there, all the police authority, standing in this circle with their hard hats on, wondering how in the world we're going to get this truck free from underneath the bridge. The little boy that's in the car is so frustrated that he can't get the Chuck E. Cheese with his grandpa. He exits the door of the vehicle, walks up to the engineers in their white coats and white hats, and he says, why don't you just let the air out of the tires and then you can drive the truck out from underneath the bridge. I mean, the truth of the matter is is that sometimes wisdom comes from the most unlikely of places. Sometimes... The answer to life's problems come from Nazareth and not Rome. Sometimes they come from the insignificant, the poor, the marginalized, rather than the rich, the wealthy, and what we would call the wise or educated. I think we need to re-look at how things work and how things we understand in the Gospel narrative understood in our lives. The amount of gold and silver that Naaman took to the prophet would have been overwhelmingly excessive. Just like the salaries of those engineers standing at the bridge. 749 pounds of silver, 190 pounds of gold, then clothing, 10 sets of clothing on top of it. This is indicative, I think, of Naaman's success story. I cannot help but think that he's trying to use his power, his success in some ways, to buy the gift of God. Do you remember Acts chapter 8? Simon the sorcerer sees Peter and the apostles and they're giving the gift of the Holy Spirit. They lay, they're not giving it. They're laying hands on people and they're receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Simon the sorcerer looks at Peter and he says, let me buy this gift from you with silver and gold. Peter turns around immediately and he answers, may your silver and gold perish with you for you thought you could buy the gift of God with a price. This is essentially the issue. How can you buy something that can only be given? You cannot buy anything from God. There is no currency when it comes to God. There's only reception when it comes to Him. You cannot buy a gift. It can only be given. God's grace, His salvation, nothing we can earn with our success. And part of Jesus' reasoning when He says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This, I believe, was the rich have conditioned themselves into thinking that because I have wealth, I can buy anything that I need, even my forgiveness. Except you cannot buy the gift of God. Naaman thought he could use his success to deal with his problems when he did not understand that there are certain things only God can deal with that success. Gold and silver are useless when we approach God. This is why, in some ways, I have a problem with television preachers who say, "Uh, if you will just send me $1,000, I'll send you my latest DVD or CD of me singing all day long or uh, snake oil or some type of uh, uh, olive tree potion or something like that. I have a problem with that because I think it incorrectly displays the grace of God. If you're going to say you can have this gift, I'll send you a free gift if you give me this much money. There's no such thing as a gift that can be bought. I don't understand that. It doesn't compute. It's not uh, biblical in my understanding. There's a billboard near Miami, Ohio at the Ohio State University campus that uh, advertises their business school um, there. And it has the letters across the billboard that says, I learned. However, 
there the L is all faded out on purpose. And it says, really, it reads, I earned. This is the farce, if you will, of our society. That we can somehow believe that it's our success that can get us somewhere in life. Everything you have in life is because God gave it to you and God made you successful. Nothing you have earned or learned in life is from your own attainment. If you truly believe Genesis 1 that says God created the heavens and the earth, all that exists, the truth of the matter is that everything you thought you created or you earned or you succeeded in was His in the first place. One of my favorite scriptures my father used to quote to me all the time, I, we didn't have money growing up. I mean, I, I, it, was just, it was just the life that we lived. My mom was one of the most frugal people I've, I've ever met in my entire life. And uh, my dad would quote to me all the time. He would say, your father in heaven owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now what is it in our minds that if we can believe that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, that one of those thousand hills, those aren't my cattle. And he owns them. We think it's ours. We think that cattle is ours on that one of those hills or two of those hills that we think we own or we own the deeded property to. And the reality is is that they were all God's cows to begin with in the first place. We've earned nothing. We've made nothing. We've built nothing. Only God can build it. The greatest uh, a Scripture to me and the most freeing Scripture that I think I've ever read lately is this, that I, Jesus says, I will build my church and the, church, and the, hell, the gates of hell will not uh, prevail against it. The first letters of that are powerful to me. I will build my church. Not Scott, but Jesus will build His church. I can't do it. Ryan can't do it. The worship team can't do it. But Jesus can do it. He can build His church. God created the heavens and the earth and everything that exists. It's not our success at all. And anything else in our belief system is idolatry, believing that I created it and that God did not create it. And if we need, I think, a mentality of the slave and not of the high commander, Naaman is discovering that his dependence upon God or dependence upon his wealth and uh, power and success was really all the time his dependence upon God. God and he never knew it. This is the paradox, I think, of human life as we contrast it towards God. We spend all this time and effort and energy to procure and to uh, succeed in something in our lives. And we work 40 plus hours a week in education. We have retirement accounts, investments, only to realize it has not been our abilities or our opportunities, but we have been relying the entire time on the grace of God. And that's the only reason we have anything in the first place. The point Naaman learns as he walks away to his homeland after his healing is is that there is a prophet in Israel. There is a gift of God in Israel, and you cannot earn it. You cannot achieve it. You can only get it by receiving it. And even in the multiplicity of conflicts that are shown to us in this narrative, there is also that of this little Jewish girl who is ripped from her family's household and taken captive in Aram to be a slave in the household of Naaman. Can you imagine her parents' prayers every night and waking day? O oh Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, protect our daughter even though we do not know where she is in the country of Aram, but let her be a light into the dark and pagan world. We have taught her your ways, O oh Lord. Let her live in them. And even though we do not see the end result of the little girl's return home, what we do see is that she becomes the hero of faith of Naaman's story and ultimately is responsible for the salvation of Naaman and I imagine his entire household from pagan unbelievers to a healed believer in the God of Israel. Worship team, would you come? There's this book that we have in our house, and Whitney, I think I read 10 books to Wesley, or I mean Whitney yesterday. Um, she's just in a reading mood, I suppose. We have this one book that my sister-in-law made for Wesley, and it has a picture of Wesley, just one picture of Wesley, and then there's a, it's basically like a Where's Waldo book for kids, 
except it uses actually my son's uh, picture. And so Whitney opens up the book and she says, where's Wesley? Where's Wesley? And there's all these faces that are spread out on this book on two pages. And every page you turn, she says, where's Wesley? And she points to him. There's Wesley. Turn the page. Where's Wesley? There's Wesley. And I think this is how we need to approach the Scriptures. Every time and every page that we open, uh, we should look at it and say, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in this story? Old and New Testament alike. We should open the Scriptures and say, where is Jesus in this story? You see the little slave girl and you say, there's Jesus right there. There's the Gospel. You see uh, Elisha the prophet telling him to go and wash and you say, there's Jesus right there. You see a man who is so proud of his accomplishment and his successes. He's pagan. He's an unbeliever. And then you see his life totally changed and radically repentant. And you say, there's Jesus right there. And this is our entire context of the Scriptures, I believe. That as we look at it deeply, we see Jesus all over this story. And all of the narratives of the Bible are like lines running together in one place, like rivers converging and rushing into a vast ocean. And that place is the Jesus death, His uh, burial, His resurrection, and His ascension to heaven. Jesus is the ocean of all of the scriptural waters as they run into. But Naaman must have been reading the business school billboards. He wants to get healed, but he goes about it his own way. The way of earning, the way of not receiving. He doesn't go to the man of God, he goes to the king. He name drops, he money drops, he pulls strings, he spends everything that he has. But what Naaman does not know is that our God is not like that. He's not a God of formulas. He's not a tame God. He is a wild God. He's not a God that can be bought with a price or silver or gold or money or anything in the earth because it's all His anyway. And nothing is more contrary to Scripture than you thinking that somehow you can earn or achieve anything from God. It's all because He has given it to you. And what we need, I believe, to do is rediscover God of grace in our lives. The truth is is that no matter uh, what you think you have accomplished in life, it is because of the grace of God that it was accomplishable in the first place. It's not hard to get anything from God. All you need with God is need in the first place. All you need with God is nothing in the first place. It's not hard to paddle around in the Jordan River. Even a child can go down to the river and dip and wash in it. And the truth is is that all of the success that you have depended on in your life is success that has been given to you by the grace of God in the first place. And you have been depending on it whether you acknowledge it or not. And so what God is saying to us this morning is just wash. What Jesus is saying to us this morning is just wash. What Naaman is saying to us, what the servants of Naaman are saying to us, what this little slave Israelite girl is saying to us is just wash. And I can make you clean. So I cannot be helped but be reminded of the story of Lady Macbeth and Shakespeare's uh, play. Remember the story, if you will. Lady Macbeth uh, helps her husband kill Duncan and Banquo. And after that, she is just arraigned by her conscience and her mind. And she goes one after the other, washing her hands, washing her hands incessantly. Remember the, uh, uh, the quotation is it's overwhelmingly powerful. She says, out, damn spot, out! All the perfumes of Arabia cannot sweeten this little hand. She sees the blood stains of Duncan and Banquo upon her hands, but she is unable in her own rights and her own ability to wash her hands of the sin that has stained her. So finally what happens is is this, is, is that her husband, Macbeth, who can now assume the throne uncontestedly because the two men that had heir to the right are dead, Macbeth calls the doctor in for his wife as she is sleepwalking in the middle of the night trying to wash her hands once again. 
And so in the middle of this scene, Act 5, Scene 1, you see the doctor, the physician, standing there with his, uh, the matron of Lady Macbeth. And Lady Macbeth has this monologue where she's trying to rid herself of the stain on her hand. And the physician says something overwhelmingly powerful. He says, this disease is beyond my practice. And then as the doctor begins to exit the scene, his words are overwhelmingly powerful. He says, foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural problems. Tainted minds. He says this. He says, she far more needs that of the divine rather than that of the physician. To her death pillow does she give her secrets. Then he begins to pray. He says, God forgive us. Forgive us all. Watch over her and remove from her the annoyance and all means of it. What happens in that story of Macbeth is is that the doctor was acknowledging his inability to clear the stains that that woman thought were on her sins but were actually on her soul. And the same thing is happening in the story of Naaman. He wants the cleansing of his soul and the leprosy on his soul but all that he needs is to wash And this is what I think the Lord is bidding us today. He's saying, just come and wash. Go to the Jordan and wash. And wash away your sins. I've made every provision and every right. It's not hard. Just go and wash.